Welcome to Shades of Us, the show that looks at the complexity of race and identity in the United States. I'm your host, Dwayne Ferguson. We're here in an area of Queens called Richmond Hill, where there's a heavy representation of the Indo-Caribbean identity. But in fusing together these two cultures, what makes up this way of life? Speaking as a Caribbean American, I understand the importance of preserving a legacy for future generations. We'll look at how Indo-Caribbean culture is defined and promoted by three people in the community. We are part of the Indo-Caribbean diaspora. Even though there is some amount of interaction with the greater diaspora that is Indian, so to speak, we are still trying to find our own ways. I feel I've been a bit of a guinea pig as to what happens when a first-generation immigrant from the Indo-Caribbean culture succeeds in a way according to the American model of success. I've used my dance platform to make sure that individuals are aware of our culture, especially our Indo-Caribbean culture. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, Indian immigrant population doubled in 2000 to 2015 from 1 million to a little over 2 million. Today, Around 50% of Guyana's population and 40% of Trinidad's population have East Indian ancestry. Inside, in their heads, they believe that one day, India would open its arms and engulf all of them, take all of them back. It never happened. My name is Dan Paul, Dan Paul Narai a school teacher in New York City. Um, I came from Guyana over 33 years ago and have been living in New York City in this Richmond Hill community primarily and um, have been making a small contribution to the upliftment of the diaspora. When the immigrants were recruited from uh, Calcutta into British Guyana into the Caribbean, and it's not only British Guyana, there are other countries. The selection was done on a haphazard basis. There was no rhyme or reason for the thing, because whoever the immigration agent took to Calcutta, they signed, who was willing to sign, to be on the ships, signed and were transported. They are a displaced people. They're neither here nor there. Lots of them worked for only five years in the plantation through the indentureship, they signed a contract. After five years, they would have returned. Many returned, but came back to the Caribbean because they lost their caste. They were not entitled to own property over there or to inherit property over there. And they said, despite the evils of indentureship, we were comfortable with our the arrangements, the societal arrangements in the Caribbean. In terms of identity in the Caribbean, people are saying, why do these races fight each other when they have so many in things in common? Why would a, an Afro-Guyanese not get along with an Indo-Guyanese? They're in the same boat. They came in the same boat, literally. But political questions, of course, surface. And these things help divide people. Local politics and a system of creolization led to identity. One had to be a Christian to go to school. One had to be a Christian to get a job in the system. And Indians were not Christians. They were Hindus, Muslims. They came with their own religion, read from their own text, spoke a different language. So it was difficult. But by the time education opened up its doors, Indians were knocking at it vigorously, robustly. They became doctors, attorneys, accountants, the professions. In 1953, there was a gentleman called Chetty Jagan, who, a young man, came back from Howard University in America and decided that his head was filled with ideas of change. And he wanted to change radically British Guyana. And he came back, formed political party, the PPP, and started to revolutionize people's thinking. Chetty Jagan won the elections in 1957. By 64, there was a period of proportional representation, which meant that Cherry Jagan lost power for 28 years. This is no time for us to be divided. Guyana, unfortunately, has too many races and too many religions. Power was now shared by 
the PNC, Mr. Burnham and Mr. Degar, they came together. During that time, during that 28 years now, the PPP was not in power. Um, Mr. Burnham had a system of government that was seen as repressive in the country. And a lot of Indians felt squeezed and discriminated against. So a lot of Indians felt that um, it was time to move, pack up and go. A lot of them came to the United States of America. The first big wave of migration into the United States of America occurred in the 70s. Migration has continued, is continuing into New York City by a large section of Indo-Caribbeans. So today, unofficial statistics in Richmond Hill and its environs suggest that you have over 250,000 to 300,000 Indo-Caribbeans. You have Indo-Caribbean stores, you have Liberty Avenue, you have Indo-Caribbean foods, the foods coming in, you know, in Little Guyana, it, Richmond Hill. So all these things are propelling and reinforcing the identity of Indo-Caribbeans in New York. Since I've been living here since 1988, I've been, uh, I would say, very intimately involved in the life, the function, and the structure of this community in various means. I'm, uh, being a school teacher, I teach the children. Uh, I teach the adults their GED. Many of them are Guyanese, from Guyanese parents, Trinidadians, Surinamese, Jamaicans, uh, uh, Spanish, a whole multicultural mosaic of students. Namaskar, Sitaram, Namaste. Welcome to Jyoti Satsang. This is your favorite television program on a Saturday at 12. With the TV show that we have had, Jyoti Satsang, that we had for over 30 years, this show has touched really the nerve of the community in that it has brought the culture into the living rooms. So if you don't want to go to the temple, for some reason, the temple is coming to you. And we also make community announcements so that what events coming up and all of that, so you can get all that information. It's dances, pageants. I'm one of the co-founders, not the founder, co-founder of the Pagua Parade. When we started um, in 30 years, uh, 32 years ago, there were only 40 people when we started the Pagua Parade. And now we all have over, according to the Daily News, over 100,000 persons, which makes it the biggest street festival in Queens. But it has evolved to this stage currently where it is not seen so much as an Indo-Caribbean event. Is it seen as a New York event? It's in, the, it's in the calendar of New York City, in the mayor's office, that we're having this parade. It closes streets off and everything. That's a big deal for this community. And also, we have people who come and celebrate who are non-Indo-Caribbeans. It has embraced other religions, other nationalities. They're all there playing, putting color on each other, and coming out and having fun while we maintain the sanctity of the occasion, which is good over evil, light over darkness. We have come here and we've brought these festivals with us, which are public, and everyone can participate, and they do. Now, our generation see America quite different from the children who were born here. The children who are born here, they are more assimilated in the system through the schools, they make friends in the schools, the teachers are there, they identify with television, things that are American. If you tell them who about Chetty Jagan, they don't know who he is or was. They don't know the system in Guyana, they're not interested. The older generation, older folks like myself, our peers, we identify with Guyana. There's not a day when Guyana, the word Guyana, or Trinidad, or Suriname is not mentioned in homes here. We are still not part of that big diaspora that is known as the Indian diaspora. We are part of the Indo-Caribbean diaspora. What we do have in common is that we all come from this great grand root motherland called India. But we split and go our separate ways when we went to the Caribbean and we did not relate back to India. Now, there have been many attempts to bring India closer to the Caribbean and the Caribbean closer to India. Persons who do that are the young people. The young people through the schools, through employment, through uh, Facebook, the social media, 
they hook up with out of South Asians and they are making a, 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 this connection which the older generation has not been able to make. For as long as I can remember, I would like pick up a camera and ask my dad questions or ask my grandmother questions about their life growing up. So it's always been a curiosity for me, especially knowing that when I would ask questions, they wouldn't have the answers. And they would always say, you know, well, no one talked about it back then. My name is Suzanne Mahadio. I am considered an Indo-Caribbean woman. My parents are Guyanese. My great-grandparents are from India. I was born and raised in Queens, New York, right here in Richmond Hill, South Ozone Park. I didn't realize that I was part of a different, let's say, culture to the mainstream until I went to college. Being able to realize that, okay, what I grew up in was a very different, it was a very small petri dish compared to the rest of the world where everybody else didn't have the same experiences I had growing up, where people understood the food, the culture, the music. So I am the descendant of indentured servants from the Caribbean. When my ancestors left India and they went to the Caribbean, by the time they were in the Caribbean, um, when my grandmother who was growing up, who was born in Guyana, she didn't really learn Hindi. And so she didn't pass that on really to my dad who did not pass it on to me. Same with my mother's side, because Hindi was punishable. If you're speaking your mother tongue, you get in trouble for it, you get hit. I didn't really get to learn much about my ancestors. I don't know what their names are. I don't know how old they were when they moved. I don't know any of the details of my ancestors from India, even though it was only, you know, three, four generations ago. Even still, despite that, I still have a connection to them in my heart, in my bones, in my DNA. It was a long journey through traveling to realize that so I taught in Thailand, China, Myanmar, and Honduras. In India is where I realized that I could not consider myself Indian. There was just a bit of a divide. I didn't necessarily feel like welcomed home as I thought I would. Um, but I did sit under the Bodhi tree where Siddhartha was enlightened and that was an amazing experience. I went all across India. I started off in Calcutta. I went all the way to the desert and then I went north. It's a very, very large country. When I did get to India, people did ask me, where is Guyana and what is Guyana and are you African? And when I had to explain, you know, the history of like, well, my ancestors were from here, but then they went to the Caribbean. And then they kind of had, a, it clicked, I think, in their head about indentureship, because I think there's a bit of an understanding as to what indentureship was. In my understanding, some people do take that as, oh, you left, they left. They abandoned India, they abandoned the motherland in a way. So I felt a bit of rejection. I do think there is a difference between folks who come from South Asia to America directly versus people who come from the Caribbean to America, mostly in terms of class. Um, and I would say that because many people who have come from South Asia do so with a visa for education, for work, for investments, things like that. Meanwhile, a lot of people, not all, but a lot of people who came from the Caribbean, including my own you know, lineage, have come from the Caribbean as laborers who are trying to make a better life for themselves through things like family visas and things like that. So many people here in Queens especially, they look to India as though that's the motherland, that's, you know, they see the Bollywood movies and that's, that's heaven right there. In Queens, everybody knows who we are because that's all, we're just Guyanese, are you Guyanese or are you Trinidadian? That was basically the thing. But when you're outside of that understanding, and no one knows who you are, and everyone asks, who are you, where do you come from, what is your face, basically, where does your face come from? Having to express and explain that whole situation, that story, time and time again, it does open up an opportunity as like a fresh kind of blank slate to connect with people. So I, I have two children. Myra is six, she was born in Mexico, and Bija is three, she was born in Panama. After I had them, it was kind of difficult to have two little kids running around on my travels and everything. So came back to New York and we've been with my parents, which is a very common thing in the culture to be able to have a multi-generational household. Sometimes people look at me and they think, oh, you live with your parents. It's like, yes, my mom cooks really well. My dad cooks really well, takes care of them. You know. I think of it as a, as a blessing to be able to have that kind of experience. So when I came back to New York, I was asked to moderate the 100 years after indentureship had ended. At the Indian Consulate, they were doing a commemoration event for it. So I was asked to moderate that. And from there, I kind of met folks who are with ICA. The ICA is the Indo-Caribbean Alliance. 
It was one of the first community organizations started by and run for the Indo-Caribbean community here in New York. They were started by three student members who were at Hunter and they saw a gap where Indo-Caribbeans did not have the resources necessarily, did not have the visibility, did not have the political representation. One of the founders of the Indo-Caribbean Alliance had asked me if I had want to interview for their director position, so I started working there. Um, in the eight months that I was there, we were able to do a lot, offering new cultural events, and we started like an Indo-Caribbean 101 workshop just to kind of talk about the, the history and the culture and things like that. Things that are now kind of coming into New York City curriculum, because if you look in the textbooks, you don't really see Indo-Caribbeans, even though it makes up, you know, the fifth largest demographic in all of New York. It's not as though I wanted necessarily to be a uh, a spokesperson or to hold a mic for this community. It, I never intended for that to happen. Now I'm focusing more on, well, what can bring fulfillment? What is fulfillment? What exactly is it beyond all this material stuff that can make people, not just myself, but how exactly can I show others, in Caribbean or not, how to find a sense of fulfillment in themselves and in their own personal journeys? There is so much intersectionality today within our communities. Um, it's really important to make sure someone feels they're not alone. When you, when you have an identity that with multiple layers, uh, on top of my many identities, being a drag queen, being openly gay, um, and you can connect to someone on such a strong, deep level. <laughs> My name is Mohammed Afzal Amin. Um, I am also known as Sundari, the Indian goddess, international drag artist. I'm also known as international dancer Zaman. My, my dancing really stems from the Indian culture and where I'm a trained Katak, Katak dancer, Bollywood, when it comes to the Caribbean culture is um, chutney, soca, and using um, dance to fuse these cultures and style of dance together and showcasing that, bridging various different communities. And I love doing that because it brings people together. It brings, you'll see community coming together when, when there's fusion of work and you, um, you see the joy and the smile on their face because they recognize their own music, whether it's a, uh, a Spanish music or whether it's a Bollywood music or, if, or whether it's soca or chutney. And that for me is really, really important when someone can look at your art and connect with you on a personal level. You can wear this by itself, or, or this one by itself, either or. I wear, <clears throat> I think it was another one I have, I, wore, I wear it by itself now. When it comes to um, Sundari, the Indian goddess, um, she brings so much hope, not only for um, individuals who are fighting, who are hurt, who are um, lost, um, who are trapped within their own bodies of identities. And she brings this awareness of you can be who you are, you can be yourself, you can be fearless. I'm one of those drag entertainers you'll find at symposiums. Um, you'll find me at rallies. You'll find me at events where there are charity events, there are cultural events, there are events where there are awareness of our community, of our people. The name in itself, Sundari, it is, it's Hindi and it's, it means beautiful. Indian goddess was um, given to me by my drag sister, Detox Bustier, who actually did my first transformation almost five to six years ago. Um, Sundari, the name itself, was given to me um, at the Rajkumari Cultural Center in Queens. My family, when we came to the United States, 
Um, I migrated here in 1996. Oftentimes, we, we hear immigrant family come to the U.S. and we go through many struggles. And yes, we do. We go through um, the struggle of being bullied when I was a young kid um, because of not having um, proper clothing and um, not being fashionable, you know, having an accent or even coming to school and smelling like hurry, right? Um, because your family is living in a small apartment, sharing spaces, and individuals not understanding your culture. So at the age of 17, I was outed by my first partner. And that was really a turning point in my life. Um, it's where I learned and I saw support for the first time. Real and genuine support. And that support didn't come from community. That support came from my siblings and my parents. Unfortunately, in my home country, Guyana, we still have the buggery law where our people are not being respected. They're being killed, they're being arrested for cross-dressing or even showing um, same-sex in um, relations in public. Sundari, the Indian goddess, uses performing arts to bridge our community, to bridge our um, East Indian community and our West Indian community. But it also brings that cultural aspect to it, um, where she is someone who <clears throat> sometimes even represent our transgender community. Because our Caribbean community, um, there are so many stigmas around LGBTQ+, right? And many times our Caribbean people do not understand the difference between someone who is transgender and someone who is a drag queen, someone who is a cross-dresser, um, or just someone who is a human being. <laughs> uh, so this one incident where I was attacked and hit over my forehead, it became a change in my life because not only I was already a dancer, well-known in our, in our community, um, where I've already stood up for LGBTQ individuals. But here I am as an LGBTQ dancer, activist, being attacked by one of my own community members, artists as well, because I'm gay. In a community that I continuously serve, I continuously donate my service, I've realized it needed to be me. It needed to be me because I was already an activist. I've already had a voice in the community. Individuals looked up to me, not only for my dancing, but standing up for our Caribbean people. And having support from the media, having support from my friends, having support from city council elective officials, having that kind of a background really gave light and courage and hope for that story. I was so proud when my brother made the decision that the Caribbean Equality Project will be born. Now we have a support group where people like myself who are openly gay can go and get counseling and get help and get referrals, which we didn't have back then. Now we have a space, a safe space, where families who are struggling with, to understand their kids can go and get help. Um, there are individuals now who are running from our Caribbean countries, fighting for as asylum here, and there's support for them. And at the end of the day, I always tell people, I'm just like you. I just embrace. I embrace where I am. I embrace people. I see you for who you are, just as I hope that you'll see me for who I am. It's one of the most beautiful and powerful things you can do for that individual and yourself. It's not only a powerful thing, but it's a human thing to do. When we can remove all these different layers of things, of struggles and baggages on yourself, and identities of, of who you should really be, when you can remove that and see, this person's just like me, they're just like me, and know that the person is not alone, and you're not alone, Life, you wake up every day feeling blessed. You wake up every day knowing that there is someone else out there in the world like me.
that's our show for now. If you want to know more about the people you saw, log on to our website at tv.cuny.edu. I'm Dwayne Ferguson, and we'll see you next time on Shades of Us.